Hey, I'm Colin Lacey, and today we're going to talk about Nats Jetstream consumers. In my last video, we talked about Jetstream streams and configuring Jetstream. If you haven't watched that, I really recommend you go back and watch it first because this video is going to pick up pretty much where that video left off. So again, if you haven't seen it, you're going to miss out on a lot of key information that's going to give context to what we're talking about with consumers. So in my previous video, I showed you an architecture similar to this, where NAT's server is configured to save data that it receives on disk, right? That's that disk storage. That's the stream. That's what we configure. And our services pipe data into that stream. And then from there, we want to be able to get data out of that disk, right? We want to be able to get data out of that stream. Well, that's what a consumer is. You can configure your consumer to only pull a subset of that data and feed it to your services that are tied to that consumer, or you can pull from all time, right? From the beginning of time, all of the data that's on that disk. And you can use multiple consumers for the same stream, and you can follow all the standard event-driven patterns like fan out, fan in, saga, right? You can do all of that with consumers and streams working together. So how are we gonna set this up? Well, in my last video I showed, I'm using the same architecture from my services framework video. Again, if you haven't seen the previous video, you got to go back and watch that. Well, in my previous video, I said I've got my requester service when it receives responses about different mathematical operations, it's going to send data to a NATS stream, the answers stream. We could figure that in the last video. Well, today I'm going to set up a consumer on that answer stream and I'm going to feed data from that consumer into a recorder service. What's that recorder service going to do? Well, it's going to record all of the answers that were received in MySQL. And that's all running in this Kubernetes cluster, right? And again, the way that this works, the reason I can have a requester on the West Coast and all of my other services on the East Coast, it's all spanning a NATS super cluster that's running in Kubernetes, right? On the East Coast in EKS, on the West Coast in Azure. So let's see what that looks like. What does it look like to set up a consumer? Well, just like in my previous video, I'm going to use the open tofu provider to set up my consumer as a resource in my NATS cluster, right? You can find all the documentation with all the configuration options here on the open tofu registry, but you can also manage it the same way you can with streams and how I mentioned in the previous video. So you can use the CLI, you can use Terraform, you can use the Kubernetes controller, you can use GitHub actions. Again, I'm using open tofu, feel free to manage these however you like. So what I've got in VS code over here, right? This is the stream I set up in the previous video. And now I'm going to set up a consumer that's going to reference that stream, right? So I'm saying this consumer will be tied to that stream. Again, consumers are filters on a specific stream. So when you set up a consumer, it has to be tied to a stream. Cool. I'm giving it a durable name, implying that this is a durable consumer. So if there's a durable consumer that also kind of gives you the impression there's a non-durable, an ephemeral consumer. And we'll take a look at what that looks like in a little bit. We're going to say, yep, deliver all, and we're going to filter subjects. So this is the filtering aspect that we talked about. We're saying only answers dot significant. Remember in my previous video, I said only answers that are greater than one are considered significant in this scenario, right? That was the data cleansing exercise. And so those will be the results passed to the answers.significant subject. There's an answers.throwaway subject that we'll take a look at in a little bit. So this is how we're filtering this data. So any service that's going to subscribe to this consumer, that's going to pull from this consumer is going to get the settings that are set here, meaning it will only get the answers.significant subject. Cool. But even with that being the case, I still have to authorize whatever services are using this consumer. And so this is a new user that I've added to my team a account. Where is it? Team a right here, team a account with Jetstream enabled, right? Here is my requester that I used in the last video. And now here is my new service that's going to subscribe to this consumer. It's the Nats recorder service. So again, that's just like the diagram showed us. We're going to record all of the data that comes in over the stream and put it in my SQL. And we're allowing it to subscribe to the answers.wildcard subjects. Without this block, 
any service that tries to subscribe to this consumer will get rejected because it hasn't been authorized. So we have to specifically authorize a service to pull from the subjects in this consumer. And it can be more broad, right? This consumer is answers.significant. We're saying answers.wildcard. Answers That's fine. As long as it's authorized to match the subjects in that consumer, it'll be authorized. Without this, it'll be rejected. Cool. So from here, I'm going to tofu plan to apply this consumer. Great. One to add. It's the consumer that I'm creating. And I'm going to tofu apply plan, apply plan. And now my consumer is created. So let's come back to the top. I'm going to say Nats consumers info answers. So remember, consumer is tied to a stream. Yep, answers consumer. That's the one I'm looking for. Here it is. This is all my info about the cons the answers consumer. It's running in Nats East. It's got 308 unprocessed messages. Why 308? Well, if I come back to Nats stream subject answers here, I'll come back to the top. 308 messages are sitting in answers.significant waiting to be processed by the answers consumer. It matches, right? That's how many messages the consumer is very well aware have not been processed by any services subscribed to this consumer. So this consumer is waiting for someone to come along and start pulling those messages. So let's look at how we're going to do that. I've got this recorder service written in Python and here it is. Here's the main entry point. Okay. I'm going to remember, I said, I'm going to pass the data that it receives into a MySQL database, right? I'm connecting over TLS, just like I did in the previous video. And once I connect over TLS, I'm going to call this subscribe and process function right here. Okay. So that is up here, subscribe and process. Now I'm passing in a flag to indicate whether or not this is a long running service. In my Kubernetes deployment, this will be long running. When I run it locally in a few minutes, it'll be short lived. I'm just gonna run it kind of as a script and it'll exit and it'll be good. So my long running service, right? I'm saying in this pull subscribe function call that's going to create my subscription on this service, I'm passing in the durable consumer name. Right? I'm saying let's subscribe to that consumer that I had just set up. So this is my pull subscribe. I'm going to fetch messages. I'm going to call this fetch messages on this subscription. And that's written all the way up here. Fetch messages. Great. I'm going to fetch each message individually with a timeout. Now you have to pass in a timeout because Nats needs a way to be able to escape this fetch context and reevaluate every so often, right? It might say, okay, there are no new messages. Let's exit the process. There might be other functionality that you want to run before the next fetch call and before the process blocks again. So keep that in mind. You have to pass in a timeout. And for me, I think I'm passing in five seconds, right? Something reasonable that gives me flexibility without being too, I guess, over ambitious, right? Not every second, not 500 milliseconds, five seconds is good. So if there are no messages, we continue. And if there are messages, we call this handle message. And this is where we actually put the data into MySQL. Now, there's a short running version of this. Just like I said, I will get to that in a little bit when we actually get to the short running version. But before we deploy this, I want to show you my MySQL database that's running in Kubernetes. Over here in this terminal, I got a command to run a MySQL client in my cluster. I'm passing in my MySQL root password. So let me run this. All right. And this is running in the East cluster. Remember this, that's what I'm configured against. All right. So now I'm in my MySQL database or I'm in my MySQL client. I've got a command over here. That's going to connect to the database. Paste this in. Yep. Now I'm in the database. Cool. So I'm going to use answers, answers, Yep. And let's see what data I have in here. Shouldn't have any. Based. Yep. Empty set. Cool. So I don't have any data in here. Let's change that. We're going to deploy the recorder. Now I've got 308 messages stored in my stream. When I deploy the recorder, I should have 308 rows in my MySQL database. So let me 
clear this. We'll bring it back up to the top. So I'll come up to this one. And I'm going to say cube cuddle apply. Yep. Okay, it's config slash recorder. Great. Let's deploy it. All right. My config map is unchanged. My recorder is created. So now I have a recorder service that's running and it's pulling data from that uh, consumer. So in this deployment, I've actually created three pods. Okay. So that's three different instances of this recorder service pulling on that consumer. So what this is going to show us is how NAS automatically load balances between those pods so that each pod is getting a certain amount of data. And that's, that's automatic load balancing built in because each pod is pulling whenever it's ready, right? So if I run that same query again, right, I'm going to select pod ID and count from this significant table, and I'm going to group them by pod ID. So if I hit enter, I've got data, great, right? All of the data that I would expect, 308, but you can also see it's split up between each of these pods relatively evenly, right? Not a big range here. So we can see that one of my deployments is probably operating on a slower node. Maybe it's a slower network connection. Maybe it's somewhere farther away in the availability zone than this one that's closer in the availability zone to where the data is actually stored. So all of that underlying infrastructure and distribution of load, it's all handled internally by NATS based on this pull subscription, right? This mechanism that automatically balances and lets each service pull whenever it's ready. Awesome. That's fantastic. I don't have to worry about the load balancing part. Okay. Very cool. So we've shown how a consumer pulls data. And if I come back over here and we want to see consumer info answers, let's look at this. My answers consumer is now aware that it has no unprocessed messages. So it's stateful. It's aware of what's going on. If I pass in another 400 requests to the answers stream, it will pull the next 400 messages or well, the next X number of significant messages, right? And process them automatically. So that's really awesome. Well, I mentioned before that there's such a thing as an ephemeral consumer. A durable consumer is aware of how much data it is pulled from a stream. It's keeping track of that. An ephemeral consumer does not. It's stood up, it pulls the data, it shuts down, and it's gone. And that's it. So anytime you stand up an ephemeral consumer, you're starting all over from wherever you want to start from. And we are going to look at that right now. So I'm going to CD into services recorder. Okay. And in here, I've got my recorder service. Now I've also got a MySQL database running locally. So if I query this, I'm going to use the throwaway subject this time. And if I query locally, you can see I've got no data in my answers.throwaway table. Well, come back into main.py. Remember I said, I've got a long running version and a short running version. Well, now we're going to use the short running version down here, right? This is if the flag is wrong, long running. Well, now we are if the flag is short running, we're going to handle messages and my timeout is going to be five seconds. So it's going to run. And once it stops seeing messages after five seconds, it's going to shut down. This is while mess, this is for message and messages handle and shut down after five seconds of receiving no messages. Awesome. So I'm going to run this. So I'm going to call Python three main.py in the recorder folder. It's going to run that recorder service locally. Now, when it does, we're going to start to see results stream in, and I got to jump to another terminal real quick, because I want to show you that ephemeral consumer in my consumers list on the answers stream. All right. So here we go. I run it. I come over here. I Nats consumer LS answers. There it is. I didn't create this manually. I definitely didn't write that crazy string of numbers and letters, right? That's an ephemeral consumer listening on the answers stream. So let's see how my recorder's doing. Okay, no more, no more messages. It is shut down. So we can expect my answers throwaway service or my answers throwaway data uh, table. If I hit, yep, there's all my answers, right? And I've got 92 records, remember. There were 308 significant records. There are 92 
throwaway answers. So if I come back to my, let's see, let's collapse this back down. I come back over to Jetstream, okay. And I say Nats Consumer LS Answers, is the ephemeral consumer there? No, it's gone. I'm gonna miss that consumer because it's an ephemeral consumer. So that state wasn't tracked at all. How do I know? Well, let's run this again. I already pulled 92 records from the throwaway table, right? If I run it again, I'm getting them all over again. So I'm creating a new consumer that isn't tracking state. And this is useful if you ever want to just pull fire hose of all the data that's stored in a stream or all the data on a specific subject. If I wanted to pull everything instead of specifically calling the, where is it? Throwaway subject here, I could do answers.star. Right. This is how you create an ephemeral consumer is you just say, give me the data on whatever subject I'm specifying, and that's going to pull all the information. So because I ran this again, I query this again, and now you can see down here, I've got 184 records. So 92 throwaway answers twice. So be aware, stateful, durable consumers keep track of how much data was pulled. Ephemeral consumers don't. They're not stateful. So that's Jetstream consumers. As you can see, there was a ton of stuff to go over here, but it's all extremely powerful, right? And we barely scratched the surface with how you can configure your consumers or how you can create mirror streams. There's a lot more that we could dig into. It's all in the documentation. So I highly recommend you check that out as well as other features like leaf nodes, object storage, key value storage, things we haven't covered at all, but it's all in the documentation. There's plenty of examples you can look at. Thanks for watching.